You are listening to Fika with Vicky on United Public Radio, 107.7 and 105.3 from New Orleans. Hello everyone and welcome to FICA. Today we'll be chatting about Louisa May Alcott with our revisiting most excellent chat partner, author Sarah Archer. Now I must admit on my side, I did not read as much of Louisa's work as I usually do in such cases because her best known novel, Little Women, is biographical fiction. And being me, I need to know what part is fiction and what part is fact. And it's not easy to know when to stop researching those facts and when to start reading the fiction before your show. Sarah, on the other hand, is easy to know because she's sitting right here <laughs> and we can ask her questions. <laughs> So let's see what's new in her life. She's been creating all kinds of things before we move on to Louisa. Thank you for joining me on these little author adventures, Sarah, and welcome back to Fika. Yeah, thanks for having me, Vicky. This is, I always love chatting with you. Um, and Louisa May Alcott is one of my favorite authors, as I was telling you, since I was a kid, just in terms of her work and her life. There's so much there that's fascinating to talk about, too. So, um, yeah, I also did not have a chance to read as much of her work or reread as much before this as I wanted to. But um, I, I think we've got a lot to talk about. She, she was a fascinating person. She was definitely her entire life and the people that she associated with and, and her pack, as it were, were all like just at that time, fascinating mm -hmm. people. But when I say you're creating all kinds of new things, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean that quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She has a good stuff for sure. Well, it's all good stuff, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I am I am writing. Um, I'm working on a new screenplay. And I've been doing some short stories and stuff. Um, I'm also eight months pregnant, so I will be delivering a life into the world <laughs> sometime around February 9th. Um, so yeah, a lot of exciting stuff going on. Exciting and kind of a world in time and yeah, just trying to live in the moment and embrace it. And one, uh, one of the most recent things that you've written with your um, co-host on Charlotte Reader's podcast, mm -hmm. Landis Wade, is, I even have it close by, Death by Podcasting. And I was lucky enough to get a copy. Thank you. And it's such a fun read. Do you want a little us know what inspired this fun? Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully it's fun, especially for readers and writers and podcasters. I think there are a lot of um, in jokes about that world that people can appreciate. But yeah, this. So my co-host Landis Wade came to me with this idea for. Initially, we were going to do it as like a, a short story or kind of one hour read, and it expanded it into a novella. Um, but it's a comedic murder mystery, kind of like Only Murders in the Building in terms of tone. Um, and it's about these two literary podcasters who get an anonymous tip that one of the three authors are going to interview for their big year-end live finale event for their show coming up in about a week um, has plans to murder them and they don't know which one they don't know who's sending them this tip they don't know why one of these authors might want to kill them uh, but as they investigate they start to kind of figure out more and more like oh this might actually be real this might not be just somebody joking around or getting a rise out of us um, so yeah we had a lot of fun writing it it was it was interesting to try like the co-writing process and we've talked a little bit on our podcast and some other events and stuff about how we did that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was different for me too, because I'm not usually a mystery writer. Uh, but I enjoyed the process. And writing with a partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a whole different, it's a whole different thing. And I think there are challenges in co-writing, but one of the things that's really nice about it that we've both agreed that we enjoyed was that you have kind of a built-in first line reader, a built-in editor. Um, so, you know, usually as a writer, you, you might give your work to beta readers or people in a critique group, you know, friends who can read and give you notes. Um, you might have a professional editor, but when you have somebody else who is writing the project with you, they are just as invested. And so you get that, like, you know, really good, thorough feedback right at the first level, which is super helpful. And it keeps you on track 
I would think mm -hmm. like, you know, you have to do your homework by the next meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever is, is necessary. Good motivation. <laughs> because you're doing, you're doing some courses now as well. You and Wade with the yeah. series that you've. We, so we also, um, in addition to this book, we actually published nine books through the podcast over the last year, which is crazy to think about. Um, he, I'll, I'll say that he did most of the work. So <laughs> I got to kind of ride his coattails with a lot of that, but um, there was the novella. And then we published an eight book series of quote books called The Right Quotes, where we pulled quotes from different author interviews we've done over the years with um, just interesting anecdotes from their careers, advice for writers, um, behind the scenes looks for readers of how they do what they do. And we've been doing some workshops um, locally uh, in the Charlotte area, Charlotte, North Carolina, just pulling lessons from those workshops or from those books um, to give kind of advice to readers and writers, which has been a lot of fun. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about, say we're ta talking about reading Louisa many, many years ago, and you wonder how much you're actually connecting with that author by reading their work. Now, something interesting happened with the review I wrote mm -hmm. <laughs> at one point, and you can go on Goodreads and look it up, or should I read it, Sarah? Or Sure, if you have it. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I have everything handy. Just in oh, case, um, you just do. in of case, you remember do. that. <laughs> You're going to be a mom soon. You will have many things just in case. <laughs> yes, <laughs> always have snacks. <laughs> Upon reading Death by Podcasting, I am positive the only, only writer's tears I'll be seeing in the future are tears of laughter. And if you don't know, writer's tears is a whiskey brand that writers tend to lean on. <laughs> Just because it's really cute. For me, it delivered a sense of mystery nostalgia, emphasized by character names such as salty remarks and the realization that i had unexplainably pictured most of the characters in fedoras and trench coats authors archer and wade have looked into our souls and recognized who we are who hasn't found themselves lured into the world of true crime whether by book podcast or series we're made to feel comfortable with this in a you're not alone way and laugh at ourselves as well as the antics in the storytelling the world needs more of this through the tactics of though the tactics authors need to take to promote their work can be scary i'm relatively certain they're not this scary if you're a writer podcaster or reader who enjoys a good guffle and mystery you should check this one out now while writing this i was i was like should i put that i saw every character in a trench coat and a fedora but i did and then sarah made a comment on facebook what was that comment sarah i think i said that landis and i were wearing fedoras and trench coats the whole time that we worked on this which you know i, I was being a bit tongue-in-cheek i will say but <laughs> honestly like if we write a sequel i'll i'll try it i'll put that <laughs> Door and trench coat on and get myself in the right state of mind. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> because yes, maybe we should try dress up. If yeah. authors try dress up to, you know, get into the ambience of the whole thing. You know, I've never, I, I've heard a lot of writers say, oh, I listen to certain music that I have like a playlist when I'm writing a certain book or I look at images. I've never heard anyone say that they like dress as a character <laughs> or dress a certain <laughs> way to get into the right inspirational mood uh but i might try that that's a good idea <laughs> go into the forest so that i can be deliberate we'll get to that <laughs> later um adam says hey y'all and hi adam thanks for hi, joining adam. us do you know adam i i don't think i do um, oh so adam soon yeah, thanks for thanks for joining the show brian says and we all know brian griner mm -hmm. author brian griner Hi, Sarah. Congratulations on the baby and the new book. Regarding the latest book, did you each write a different chapter or scene? How did you manage to blend the two voices? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and thanks for the congratulations, too. Um, so we we kind of figured out our co-writing process as we went. Landis had the initial idea for the story, and we worked together a little bit to sort of beat it out and figure out where the story might go and, you know, the, the whodunit kind of angle of things. Um, and then for different chapters, we 
each wrote a first draft of them, and then we would pass them back and forth and edit each other's work. So we definitely had our, both our hands on each chapter by the time we were done with it. Um, but we did initially write different chapters individually. Um, and I think that's you know one of the challenges of the co-writing too, is how do you, because even if you're kind of similar as readers and writers, there's always gonna be some kind of disjunction between your voices. Um, so just trying to, trying to kind of match those up. But we had some beta readers look at it and they said they couldn't tell who wrote which chapter. So hopefully we blended them pretty well. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't really notice. I didn't think about it before, but I didn't see a break, like any kind of break or confusion or with it. It seemed pretty to flow pretty. Um, That's good. That's good. Okay, Janice, author Janice Richardson popped over to Amazon and checked out your new book. She says it's her kind of read and immediately went on to her Kindle. Looking forward to reading and reviewing it. Oh, thanks, Jan. We appreciate that. I hope that you enjoy it. Okay. Brian says, hearing you discuss wearing fedoras and trench coats makes him wonder if you were inspired by the Thin Man stories or movies. Oh, no, we actually, I don't think that we looked at that as like an inspiration or comp with these. I, I do enjoy um, those movies. And I think they're actually talking about remaking them and doing a contemporary version of The Thin Man. Um, we'll see We'll see if that's an improvement or not. <laughs> Sometimes remaking an old classic can be a bad idea. But, uh, but yeah, I think that um, Only Murders in the Building, which I mentioned, was like a big inspiration in terms of kind of the tone and the blend of comedy and uh, suspense. Um, we were trying to hit kind of the cozy mystery genre where there are real stakes and there's real danger, but it's not kind of blood, guts, and gore sort of suspense or, you know, murder mystery. No, no. Um, yeah, it is much more about kind of the detective work. And the, the two main characters, the podcasters, are also um, writers of mysteries and thrillers, so they kind of pull on some of their experience and tropes from books that they've read and how people solve these mysteries in books when they're solving their own mystery. I saw it sort of as a bogey, um, Dashiell Hammett mm -hmm. um, kind of thing when I saw the fedoras and the trench coats. And of course, Steve Martin in Only Murders in the Building, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of era and age. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Um, moving on to Louisa and, and yeah. how we relate to her. So she was always one of your favorite authors growing mm -hmm. up. Um, do you want to tell us about when you first read her and, and what, what gravitated you towards her? And I mean, because yeah. everyone you've ever read is an inspiration to your writing in right, any right. way. So how does that work? You know, I, I don't remember exactly how old I was when I first read her work. Um, and certainly Little Women was my introduction to her. Um, but I, I remember ever since I was a kid, really enjoying her. And I've read that book a, a number of times over the years as well as some of her other work. I think that I connected, for one thing, just with her voice. She has a very kind of readable author voice that's entertaining and a little bit witty and funny um, without being kind of hitting your head with that. She can also be sentimental without... Um, I think that she balances the humor and the sentiment well, and she can be, she can deliver a moral in a way that feels maybe a little heavy handed for modern readers, but is still kind of couched in the story um, in a way that's enjoyable. I think with Little Women specifically, one, one thing that I love about it is that it's just about real life. Like it's, it's real people and it's kind of the day to day dramas of their lives. It's not some kind of huge event um, but to me, that's still so interesting. And I, I've always been a very kind of character driven reader and writer. And so I love reading about just kind of ordinary people and their lives. And I think that that's a big takeaway from her career, too, is that her most successful works, um, Little Women and, and things like Joe's Boys, which followed. And prior to that, she had a, a, a lesser success, but still successful with um, a book called Hospital Sketches she put out, which was uh, fictionalized, but it was based on her experiences as a Civil War nurse. And I think that was also one of the first times that she had really written something that was kind of just her life and real events. And seeing how people responded to that, um, I think was was powerful for her. And that's a good reminder for me too, that you can just write about 
real people and <laughs> just make it feel authentic and make it feel real. And um, people are interested in other people. They're interested in real life as long as you can tap into something that feels um, like it's an honest portrayal of who people are. Well, because real life is, is I think, um, it, it, real life, sorry. <laughs> just trying to get something out in the comments there. Real life can be more interesting than fiction mm -hmm. or that we can imagine. And if it if it isn't quite, we have to remember the times that it was written in and what was expected of, yeah. of young women in that at that time. And that would be a part of what it is, what is 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 in the writing. But I mean, I think that was a question even to her. She didn't feel that people would be interested in her real life. Like she yeah. said, is she thought only the girls themselves in Little Women would, her sisters, um, yeah, would be actually, interested in the plays and things that they put on. There's a quote um, I pulled out about that. So let's see. This is a quote from one of her journals when she started writing Little Women. She says, Mr. N, I believe that was her publisher, um, wants a girl's story and I begin Little Women. Marmy, Anna, and May all approve my plan. So I plot away, though I don't enjoy this sort of thing. Never liked girls or knew many except my sisters, but our queer plays and experiences may prove interesting, though I doubt it. <laughs> so she was not very <laughs> optimistic about this book's success. <laughs> well, I think I think we have to read. Okay, so let's take Louisa, mm -hmm. and of course we're going to compare her to Joe in Little Women because mm -hmm. that was her counterpart in the story. Now, like Little Women, um, now in that book the father was off fighting the war so he was absent during that for that reason louise's father however had many very idealistic um ideas that was probably not idealistic ideas <laughs> and, they were though. they were they're very <laughs> idealistic ideas that he had. <laughs> and that didn't involve working mm -hmm. so joe had to be pragmatic she had to be practical she had to make things work and so even with her writing she is thinking in terms of of what's going to work and and what's not going to so I don't think it was it was so much of a, a putting down as of herself and her life as okay I'm not going to be bothered to spend time on this if mm -hmm. if it's not going to if it's not going to <laughs> make any move up yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> if people are going to read it then you know because she was writing for that reason mm -hmm. her family was destitute and someone had to step up and take care of things yeah and i think that's one of the things that really to me kind of defines her as a writer is that combination of the creativity and the idealism and the kind of high ethics that she had and progressive ethics um, and her imaginative side, but then she was also very practical. Um, she was driven by wanting to earn money as a writer and, and provide for her family. Um, and I think that you you see that kind of combination in her parents too. Like you said, her father, you know, he was a philosopher, he was a, a writer, but he wasn't necessarily that successful at it. <laughs> um, and he was, it seems like he was very sort of, you know, head in the clouds kind of guy. And he actually has, or she has a, uh, a, I guess you would call it a novella. It's like a kind of longer short story um, called Transcendental Wild Oats, which is a satire based on this actual commune that her father started and her family was part of and that failed miserably. They're like trying to be vegan and none of them know how to grow plants. <laughs> so they, they didn't really have anything to eat. Um, but her mom then had to kind of pick up the slack and, and take care of the family and keep them afloat. And I think that Louisa got both of those sides in, in her as a writer. Yes, yes. Uh, it, 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 I want to read that satirical. Um, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny. It's, so, I mean, we cannot discuss her without getting into transcendentalism. Mm -hmm. I think I said that right. <laughs> because it was, a, it was a big influencer in her life. She mm -hmm. herself, I do not think, took to it in her older years because it wasn't practical. And she saw from a child's perspective how it didn't really work in a family type setting but both her parents were involved in that um her father was friends with um 
I think both names are Ralph, so the same. Ralph, Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson and that's, Henry David Thoreau. That's right. And some friends. some places had Daniel Hawthorne thrown in there yeah, as well. I think they actually lived next door to the Hawthorns. I believe they 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 knew the family pretty well. Because Emerson seemed to be, you know, I'll give you a house and I'll give you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the man had money, okay? So it's like going to an Oprah show and look yeah. under your chair and you'll find out. Look at the house. <laughs> That's right. So he was he was a good guy to know. So mm -hmm. these were all prominent figures in in um, that spiritual endeavor, and and she was taught by them. She was she was you know taught taken on nature walks, um, mm -hmm. taught about biology and 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 plants and sciences and all of these things from these gentlemen mm -hmm. however as, as as intelligent as they were and and you know as marketable as they were making this um transcendentalism i have problems with that one um <laughs> it's basically but it's based on the idea of of the fact that we are divine so it separated itself from the idea that we are born with sin and went to um we are born good and mm -hmm. that we can and that we can um and so that we can you know learn through insight rather than experience and ex and practicality <laughs> logic yeah. what the truth is and and so these kids when they went to the commune what i read is that the kids were working from morning to night mm -hmm. so we don't i mean i one of the things her father did by reforming education is to take away corporal punishment so the kids weren't beaten in the classroom um and so i will give him that <laughs> overly fond of the man because his ideals are like i believe that women i believe in feminism and that they mm -hmm. use that word that and that women should be independent especially my wife who needs to work to support me yes. <laughs> <laughs> my daughters too will learn to find goodness through working from eight o'clock in the morning till bedtime and in between having these discussions <laughs> about mm -hmm. philosophy um at 10 years old so i i have a feeling they say that she as joe did um dealt with her anger most of her life but i think she has some reasons to be angry that stayed with her from yeah her. and i think that um some of it i'm sure was related to her upbringing and frustration with the family's lack of money and being sort of peripatetic and not really settled. Um, I think her father at one point went off for about a year to, in theory, to work and to do teaching and writing and earn some money. He came back and he had earned a dollar. Um, and his, his, you know, which even at the time was not great for a year. Um, and his wife was very you know, patient about it, but she, she really was kind of the backbone who kept them grounded. And I think that Louisa probably also had anger just more in general at the society. I mean, her values are pretty progressive at the time. She was a big proponent of women's suffrage, um, of abolition. And she she talked at different points about kind of wishing that she had been born a boy. Um, and I don't know how much of that was maybe just her innate feelings about herself and how much was struggling against the strictures against women at the uh, time. But she definitely, she felt boxed in within that society, I think. I feel, I mean, this, we have to, like, we, okay, I didn't read people I watched. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> the inheritance okay <laughs> all the time while i was you know doing the cleaning or whatever i've been like listening to documentaries and everything on her because she's so fascinating yeah. so in inheritance um women were not allowed to ride side saddle they definitely mm -hmm. couldn't wear pants i mean it was all about being pretty and sitting there and and so there's anger there's anger i feel that it was the times because we have to take things contextually mm -hmm. um a lot of women were angry like if you got if you left your husband he could just take the children 
and they were owned by him as much mm -hmm. as you you know how many women were sent off to asylums because they were no longer convenient or they had differing ideas yeah. and if you yeah. if you went to a suffragette meeting you might be beaten which would be reasonable according to all the other people because this man had to keep his family in control or he wouldn't be a man i'm not saying it was each individual male's problem but it was definitely mm -hmm. so uh, i know even when i was little and <laughs> i'm a different kid i got bought the little white gloves and a little straw hat mm -hmm. to to wear to church i hated them i wanted to wear <laughs> cowboy pants <laughs> 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 So in those cases, I definitely under that strict regime um, was like, I want to be a boy. Yeah. <laughs> so I can wear a cowboy and not these silly gloves. Uh, some girls love them, but it was just not, you know, the gender roles were definitely placed in certain places. So yeah. it's so you and meanwhile, um, for those of you who have read the book, if you feel like I did, Meg drove me right around the bin. Okay. <laughs> Angler, and I thought, oh my goodness, teenagers really haven't changed. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> like well, I think that's one of the things that people like about the book and why Little Women and why it's still, you know, its popularity has endured so much is because the characters still feel very, very real, and everybody reading it is like, well, which one are you? You know, everybody has their March sister that's there. It's like your Hogwarts house. You have to know like which house you're in. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you're going after Meg and not Amy because I've always been an Amy fan. And I feel like people are always down on Amy. Are you <laughs> I understand that for the her. Family? I am. I am. Oh, okay. So I'm sure that that's part of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think like Amy, she kind of gets short shrift. I think sometimes people don't like her because they wanted Joe and Lori to end up together and Lori and Amy end up together instead. And people are mad about that. And also Amy, like she's kind of a brat sometimes, but you know, she's really? the youngest and she, she's, she's creative. She's artistic. She like goes off and does things with her life. Um, you know, I think, I think Amy is, she's not all bad. I like Amy. <laughs> um, she is as a middle child. Let me tell you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, it, I, in the Lori thing would never have worked out because they were friends mm -hmm. and because mm -hmm. we saw it. And also he was still very much enamored with that whole idea of mother and things like that. Like the, what he got from the March family, yeah, right? Yeah. Joe was, but the fact that she married an intellectual who also saw her as intelligent that would have been an ending for Joe that worked. Yeah, I think so. For Louisa. Did you um, did you see the most recent movie adaptation, the Greta Gerwig one? I haven't. I have not had time. Like, this is why I call this an introduction because <laughs> and then I still will have to. No, but I definitely want to watch it because she apparently – the director edited it different than the book yeah yeah and i mean there are so many different adaptations of little women so yeah there, there's not time to watch them all but with that one um i think there were two significant things that stretched me in terms of what she changed and one was with the ending it, it seemed like she was sort of implying that the marrying joe off to professor bear in the book was maybe a concession to like the morals and the desires of readers at the time as opposed to something that Alcott may have really felt was natural for the character and that she, it was more about like she wanted to write and wanted to focus on her career, but she had to have a happy ending with a marriage and love. And so that character was brought in. Um, and she also, she did kind of change the chronology a bit and she kind of went back and forth between different timelines in terms of how she structured the story. I, I can see that, 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 that is why she put a marriage in the book. Mm -hmm. But in choosing, so choosing to have her marry for for her marrying, that could be a logic. But choosing who she married, I think most people would have expected her to marry Lori. And therefore, she acted out in a way. But yeah. back to this Amy thing. Okay. So, <laughs> no, I think... I, I think that there was probably a, you know, Amy wasn't quite aware of everything that was happening because she was younger. 
Of course. Mm -hmm. And Joe was a middle child. So Meg was beautiful. Um, Beth was sweet. Mm -hmm. Amy was the baby. Mm -hmm. And that left her forging this identity because she did see what was going on. So in real life, she did pay for May's, Amy's counterpart, May's art education. Mm -hmm. And as we talked earlier in the gray room, um, ended up raising a, raising May's child when she yeah. passed and, and giving her everything. So she doesn't, she wasn't, like horrible to me mm -hmm. <laughs> the world can see but you know probably people are down on Amy because they're not the babies of the family that's why I asked <laughs> there's a certain dynamic there. it's so, a different perspective yeah <laughs> yeah so she sort of had Joe's temperament with with Meg's uppityness I think maybe with that's a good way to put it yeah I do get the impression just from from what I've read that in real life um, Louisa and May, the kind of Amy counterpart, were probably that was the sister she was closest with, it seems like. And I think they could relate because they both, you know, May did visual art um, and Joe had her, or Louisa had, had her writing. So they were both creative people. They were both kind of ambitious. Um, May named her daughter after Louisa, like even, you know, before she, without knowing that Louisa would end up raising her, she named her after, I think she named her Louisa May. Um, so yeah, it seems like they, they in real life were pretty close and got along well. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm all, I'm I, always I, 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 no, no, no. I'm not I'm not I'm I'm saying and it's not even their fault that there yeah. I feel like there was a resentment there due to the circumstances. Like yeah. if you always have to be responsible, if you always have to hold things in shelter ever everybody else, if you ever mm -hmm. occasionally you're going to say Oh my goodness, she gets everything. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like that's totally true. Yeah. I, I I don't feel like Joe got a chance to be an innocent child. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, yeah, that's very true. Brian says, Sarah, given how much you enjoy Little Women, do you see yourself writing a modernized version of the story? Perhaps have them wear fedoras and church coats. <laughs> Well, that's that's definitely the first step if I do write an adaptation of the doors and trench coats. I'm sure, honestly, there have been so many adaptations of Little Women in various forms. I'm sure there is one that's like a mystery where they're detectives or something. Um, that would make yeah, a great I, series, like the girls, the girls doing cases, like junior. Yeah, detectives. yeah. I did. I what I did like about the book mm. is that they were so creative that they were yeah. never, never you know, bored or, or said they were bored. Well, maybe Meg, um, or <laughs> they were bored or whatever, but they, you know, these plays and finding things to do and stuff mm -hmm. was, was, there was always imagination. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's kind of like nice and charming about the books too, is that even without money, they, they make their own fun. They make their own adventures. They treat life as an adventure. Um, and they have, you know, I guess Meg doesn't really have as much in terms of like, creative pursuits, but uh, Joe has her writing, Beth has her music, Amy has her art. Um, they do these plays together. So yeah, they are, they're, they are very creative and they, they find a way to kind of make every moment lively, even though they didn't have much. And the mother, the mother in the book, mm -hmm. which apparently what I've side read was um, the relationship with Joe was very much, they were very much similar. So she, you know, was like, I know what you're going through, kid. I had to work through mm -hmm. anger as well. La, 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 la. What she says in the book about what I want for you girls is to find someone who loves you that you are happy to be with. You know, if you stay with, if you get married and you're happy, that's fine. If you go off on your pursuits, that's fine if you stay here with us that's fine i just want you to be safe and secure and happy it's so um above as we said ahead of the time because yeah. it would have been if there was a lorry in real life that they hung up there would be matchmaking involved there would be but she didn't want her girls to be um involved in that kind of because Honestly, the 19th century. There, Meg was only 17 years old, like halfway through the book. Like, yeah, that was crazy to think about. It's it, it just it just kills me. At what point were um you know granted lifespan wasn't 
<laughs> still let them get married older and make it shorter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you look back at um, some of Louise's letters and I think even when she was like 27 or 28, she was referring to herself as a spinster and an old maid and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm so old now. <laughs> but you know, I guess at the time, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I must, you know. Long past her prime. <laughs> It's, it's over with. Um, but I think she, I mean, when we, I think that she set herself to remain single because her main priority was to take mm -hmm. care of the family and to be, you know, she would have taken on then male role models such as the grandfather next door, people in real life that supported their family, were there for their family, you know, things that her father didn't do. And yet she still went back and nursed him and everything when he was sick. Yeah. Yeah, her relationship with her parents, I think, are very interesting. And her father, I, definitely from what I've read and it sounds like from what you heard, he was not a great provider in a lot of ways, um, maybe not a great role model in some ways. But I think that she really loved him and had a lot of affection for him. And they were close throughout their lives. They actually died. I think he died. And then two days later, she died. So they they died within a very short span of each other. Um and she certainly got, I think, some of her intellectual side from him, but then she she also lived in the real world, <laughs> maybe more than he did. Um, but her mother was interesting too, and I, I actually, I don't know that much about her. I think her name was Abba. Um, I would love to learn more about her because I read something somewhere that she actually had like a lot of writing talent from what we've seen from her, her letters or papers that we have preserved, but you never really hear about that. Um. Well, she didn't have time for yeah. pursuits because she was providing for the family as best exactly. as she could <clears throat> and worked as what would now be called a social worker, but was a mm -hmm. church worker at that point for the poor and things like that, which once again, ideals brought danger to the household because, you know, she would feed people with smallpox in the yard and the girls would get sick and things from this so yeah. um more and even yeah I, I think also like with uh louisa's work as a civil war nurse she got um typhoid or something i forget what it was, yeah, she got some kind it was of, typhoid. yeah some kind of illness and then apparently not even just the illness but the cures they tried on her really messed with her health and the gave mercury. her lifelong yes. yeah lifelong health issues um and that was another thing that was from her trying to help people and trying to do the right thing so if you're sitting there and you're a big little woman fan because of the romanticism of it or mm -hmm. emily bronte or any of those things there was no good old days ladies <laughs> <laughs> it was <true>. awful. <laughs> Those guys did not brush their teeth every morning. So think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> it's it's not all it was cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. I think the story that stuck with me, and I and I have to um, confirm that I have to go back, but I I know the details. So if it was true, is that because? their idea was to raise the children to be you know um divine and to be giving and to i mean there were times that the girls would go hungry because their mother would give half the rations to someone else that was hungry and that's in real life and that's demonstrated in the christmas scene in in the book right, right. but the 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 lecturer was telling a story about when louisa was three years old and it was her birthday and she took cupcakes to her father's school to share with the other children. And it came down to being one cupcake <laughs> and Louisa and another child. And Louisa didn't want to give up her birthday cupcake. Yeah. <laughs> As, you know, hold tight, Louisa, <laughs> for heaven's sakes. And, and um, they, you know, gave her the whole song and dance, which I'm beginning to think is almost as abusive as, as getting, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know louisa you know this is that you know you're a bigger person and you can do this and blah 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 and she gave up her birthday cupcake uh -huh. so you know i can i can take that if they're stopping at you know <laughs> the bakery on the way home and picking up mm -hmm. another one or whatever but apparently like she you know she told the story as what a good girl was i and i was learning but you know other sources say that stayed with her her whole life on her birthdays like yeah yeah that cupcake story yeah and, and that kind of self-abnegation i think was such a big part of her life and 
I, one thing I wonder in reading her work and reading about her was like, was she ever really happy? Because it seems like so much of her work was done to try to earn money, which her goal was to help her family. Um, like when she was younger, she was writing a lot of kind of pot boiler thriller stories because they sold, but she said that she was just doing that more for the money. Um, when Little Women was a success and then she followed that up with other similar books, she said that that wasn't really where her heart was creatively, but she did that for the money. Um, she she gave up a lot of her time and energy and health to help her family. And, and like we talked about to raise May's daughter um, after she was born. And I think May passed away within like a couple of months of her daughter being born. And so then Louisa, when she had her own health issues, was now raising this young kid, which she wasn't prepared for. Uh, so yeah, she, she sacrificed so much for herself. And I'm not sure if she ever really felt like she was living the way she wanted to live. But in this belief system, or what I've read from her parents and what, I mean, happiness is what you gain by doing service for other people. Yeah. yeah. So it would depend on her definition of happiness. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I believe she found some fulfillment in taking care of people that she loved because no one else was going to do it. Right. right. Um, but that's also how much of that. I mean, we definitely believe what we're taught as children when it's ingrained. I, I feel like this is more of a guilt um, thing than, <laughs> you know, you know, there is a fear and ending up in the wrong place if you mm -hmm. don't give up your cupcake or disappointing your parents or whatever. There's like this underlying like mm -hmm. psychological brainwashing, whatever you want to call it, that goes on with something like that. So how much of her own, I, I mean, she definitely had her own ideas, but how much that background colored it right i don't know yeah that, that's interesting and, and also just thinking about like her relationship with religion that's something that i would like to learn more about i know i mean i think nominally she was christian um and that there's some kind of references to christianity and christian morals and ideals woven in through her writing which i think was come you know kind of the the base at the time that was very commonplace um I, I read a quote from her at some point where she said she actually was very interested in buddhism and felt attracted to that philosophy um and that she saw jesus as a prophet but not necessarily as um the a god or the son of god yeah yeah so I, I think that she was at the very least like open spiritually um and she did connect to, to spirituality and to god a lot through nature she talked about having experiences where she would go out into the woods and stuff. And, and that was where it seems like she felt really connected to however she defined God, her version of God. Well, transcendental. <laughs> so, okay, word. people, you know what I mean. Transcendentalism. <laughs> I, I, okay. So anyways, I mean, that's the basis of that. It is mm -hmm. a God, it is a religious pursuit, but they see it through action and service rather than, you know, the other ways and it is based on nature that nature people all of those things have that divine thing so yeah. an openness would come from that base philosophy but i think you know you keep the ideas of whatever you learn but you throw away you know the things that you don't like about it so the impractical practical okay it wasn't very practical <laughs> 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 too many words starting off with autobiographical but <laughs> autobiographical yeah, in there. Like, and yeah i i i listened to the thing and i practiced it but it's just not coming up there are just words we all have words people if you want to share your words with us go ahead <laughs> share your tongue sisters please <laughs> So back to her gothic thriller writing, I want yeah. to, there's, um, you said you had an anthology. Was it Behind a Mask? What no, it's, um, the one that I read is called um, an intimate anthology, I believe. It's, it's okay. It was put okay. out by the New York Public Library. Uh, but it has a few of her sort of dark thriller stories in there. It has hospital sketches. It has transcendental wild oats. It has some of her letters and essays and poems. So it's kind of like a compendium of kind of, the greatest hits other that weren't the greatest hits, if that makes sense. <laughs> Not little women. <laughs> <laughs> makes perfect sense. Um, and and I think to an extent that is if she was going to write mm -hmm. more of what she would like to 
Right. Like she called that blood and thunder writing. And she yeah, always said, yeah. even in Little Women, she said she had a, a attraction to the lurid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and she also she published a, a novel called I think it was called a modern Mephistopheles. There's another difficult word there, but um, that one was published maybe about a decade after Little Women, and she she did it anonymously. And that was I don't think it was quite as like um, kind of steamy and lurid as some of her earlier pop boiler stories, but it was definitely like a dark psychological drama very different from little women and i think that was one that maybe was more in line with what she actually wanted to do creatively uh but yeah it, it's almost hard to like put a finger on where her heart was in her writing and, and if she wasn't thinking at all about making money or about the practical side of things what would where, she have wanted to write yeah if she was really independent of her own thoughts and mm -hmm. and, and once again um, she, she did a landmark thing with Joe in Little Women as far as literature of the time went. Mm -hmm. So if she was a woman writing some of these other topics, it would have, it would, that just reminds me another female author I am very, very interested in, in her relationship with her mother. And I want to read more about her mother is Mary Shelley mm -hmm. and Frankenstein. Yeah. And another, another, which I know is not the monster, but the Dr. Brian, before we go there, um, <laughs> that. <laughs> I still say the doctor is the monster. So, but but she, she uh, there's another word that's not going to come out today. Today is not a good day for words, but she had a title similar to this. <laughs> <laughs> Go look it up, and I'm just I'm I'm now thinking about about the um because authors ran impacts, and because there mm -hmm. was like you have this whole um Waldo, you know, yeah. and she came up through that pack, and all these people hanging together, and then you mm -hmm. had like um Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley and um and. Percy Bysshe Shelley, I think, was relate, related as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm not impressed with him either. Um, <laughs> no, it's right. <laughs> I just get into these things and I just think, oh, these guys. Like, I'm not blaming all men or whatever. There's just, you know, um, you know, he's busy writing and fulfilling himself. Well, mm -hmm. they didn't eat and their children weren't warm. And how many yeah. children yeah. did she lose? Like, it, 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 it just, there seems to be a commonality. Um um, there, but they did even up to like um, Hemingway and Fitzgerald and mm -hmm. you know, those people all were. So it's it's sort of interesting how much the pack would influence other people, the other people around them. In the writing is something that I'm always, I'm always. Yeah, that's so true. Like I think I could see if if Louisa had been raised under different circumstances, would she have? found writing. I mean, I think she would have been a creative and intelligent and curious person no matter what, because that seems like that was just who she was. But, you know, would she have seen writing as a way to try to make a living, um, especially as a woman at the time, um, if she hadn't been raised in a community where she saw so many examples of that? Um, yeah, no, it, like I said, she was, that is one thing that was given to her, is the idea mm -hmm. that this could be, even though the I was, we're not as successful yeah. um you know it it, it it that it is a it is a practicality writing is seen as a way to making money which how many mm -hmm. households would that be would that be possible yeah right? and even today i mean if you want to make money don't be a writer <laughs> <laughs> see and, but now other writers not, are telling you that yes, the days of the big mainstream you know the big authors mm -hmm. um are are not as as much and even so there's yeah. probably about 20 to 30 big names would you say um, yeah that well, are names yeah, I think it's, it's, I mean, just broadly looking at the market today, it's like there are some people at the very top who make tons of money. And then there's a lot of people at the bottom who don't make any money. Um, and then the kind of mid list is much smaller. It's much harder to just make like a decent living and, and make a steady living as a writer. Um, well, but she, good, she may not do that. You, 
well, there weren't as many writers at that point in time either, yeah, so sure. it was easier to to break out, at mm -hmm. midst, you know, because <laughs> it's not like, oh, let's go look at Amazon. <laughs> Louise is like, oh my goodness, you expect me to make money with all these books? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're in an interesting position because you were published. Mm -hmm. And Death by Podcasting is indie, right? Yeah, indie yeah, we published that independently. Yes. So so you didn't get a castle or anything because you got published. No, no. Yeah, I think, I mean, for, for me at this point, I've had experience with both traditional and indie, even though with Death by Podcasting um, and doing the, the indie route there, I had a lot of help because my co-writer Landis has um, done that before. So he kind of already had a system in place and knew the ropes of how all that works. Um, but yeah, like, the, you know, there's so little money in it. And even looking at Louise's career, like she, when she became famous and successful, she would have younger writers write to her all the time and ask for advice. And she would tell them like, success is a long road. It's, it's not something that happens overnight. Um, sometimes it comes to people who don't deserve it, people who do deserve it, don't find it. And I think that she also had very mixed feelings about her success and her fame. I think she was definitely happy to be able to make money for her family. Um, but then once Little Women came out and was this big kind of splash, she she would have like reporters around her house <laughs> and fans coming to her house and people like hanging out in the garden, wanting to sketch her, wanting to talk to her family. And she actually talked about having to just like say no to these people and shut them out. Um, and, you know, most writers, we don't have the problem with having paparazzi around our house, but <laughs> we, we still have to learn to make boundaries and find time to actually write. Well, this is an important thing because writers tend to be observant, mm -hmm. quiet, introverted people. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, but, but obviously you have to be observant and that takes quiet watchfulness as opposed mm -hmm. to, to, to get those ideas to put down on that paper, right? How people right, are, right. Or whatever. So no, they don't want to be <laughs> reporters standing outside their door and, and and all of those things but as we find out in death by podcasting you have to do whatever you need to do to market oh, yeah. <laughs> you know so louisa did have a publisher come to her and say write mm -hmm. this book please and she said no 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 one's gonna want to read it i mean mm -hmm. many 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 years later um they still they still are i have to give it a full another read and give it a chance um, I'm, Brian is saying, I might, I think it might be worth pointing out that Ms. Elcott and others of her day wrote everything by hand, no computers, no word processors, gives a whole new view of what it was to edit. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, and even like, probably to me, the most harrowing scene, even more so than like Beth dying <laughs> in Little Women is when, uh, Amy, you know, this is, this is not her finest moment, but she, she throws Joe's manuscript that she's been working on in the fire and burns it. And you know, you don't have a backup. You don't have Google drive then. So that whole book that she had been writing was just gone. Which um, was years, but you continue defending Amy, Sarah. No, I mean, we all make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> she was young. <laughs> That's definitely not her, her best moment. <laughs> No, she was young still, though. I mean, she acted, we read that now, and we see a 16-year-old, but she was 12. And 12 is mm -hmm. a hard year. And, yeah. and you know, but she was like, I'm going to the opera, and I'm going because I have my own money. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, there wasn't. So, um I, when I was watching the documentaries, um, at the corner of my eye, they showed her desk. And honest to goodness, it's like maybe two and a half feet wide <laughs> the, the, the wow. desk she wrote at and like two feet this way you know no piles for like a million different colored pens yeah and, yeah and posted notes and you know it all happened in this much space it's amazing but yeah i think we, we get so caught up sometimes as writers these days with like oh well, what software do you use and are you you know using pinterest to organize like inspiration photos and making playlists for inspiration and um, you know, we have all these tools at our disposal and sometimes we have to just like sit down and write, <laughs> just do the work. 
it just it just comes down to it. Even when I was younger and I was, you know, scribbling away, I think about that time now when there was only electric typewriter. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh my goodness, like to be able to check a spelling or pop, you know, pop in a name or yeah. I wonder what this means. Um, not that I always believe the internet, but like any little thing, it just wasn't there. You yeah. know, if you, you you had to it all had to happen um manually so yeah that was yeah there there are supposedly um benefits to writing longhand i i've heard a lot of people say they feel more creative when they do that or they get more done but I, like my handwriting is so bad <laughs> and i'm just not used to doing it so my hand gets cramped really easily if i'm writing you know a lot of text out so yeah i just do it all on a computer it's so much easier to edit I've mentioned before, and I did hear Neil Gaiman say that he wrote his first draft of all books out by hand. Oh, wow. And I keep thinking of um, American Gods. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think, oh, my goodness. That's a lot of writing. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have the patience for that. But he says that you write less. It takes less editing because he was editing for a magazine when, when, you know, the word counts and the computers and that came over. Oh, and it went from writers writing a thousand words to 3000 words Mm -hmm. that needed to be cut because when you're writing it, you're thinking about doing this as easily (laughs) as possible. Well, I guess when you're, when you're writing longhand, it does kind of take more time for the, I, for it to go from an idea in your brain onto the page. Um, and so there's almost like an extra second of editing that goes on there before you're even writing it down. But definitely people, Louisa May Alcott, if you haven't read Little Women for 40 years, go mm-hmm. back and reread it and see what you think about it today. Definitely I'm on to checking out these gossip gothic thrillers mm-hmm. uh, because I always like a good gothic. She has, she has <laughs> one I would like to read. I forget what it's called, but supposedly it's all about these people like being on hashish and having some kind of weird um, high or orgy or something. So she's got some interesting stuff out there for sure. Would be scandalous for a woman at that time to mm-hmm. write. Yeah. Uh, what was her pen name? It, I think it was like it was initialed. It wasn't even saying oh, I don't this know. Is a, a woman or a or a or a man. This yeah, is, that would make sense. Um, you know, it's just it's just a person, a person writing this, which is a novel concept. So, in summarizing today, I think her background both allowed her to be a writer but did not allow her to the freedom to choose her writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, just cause who's saying that back in his day, because Santa is centuries and centuries old. They had to chip everything out on rocks. (laughs) Talk about trying to edit. Ha ha ha. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, and I don't think so because St. Nicholas would have had manuscripts. So um, I, think, I think, I think, I think, so I think that her background both allowed her to see writing as a money making venue, but mm-hmm. also having to support the family didn't give her the freedom to write as she might have wanted to. Yeah, that's true. I mean, she couldn't, she had to work hard at it and had to be um, diligent and productive because she couldn't afford to be a dilettante, but yeah, was she really creatively fulfilled by most of what she was writing? I don't know. It's, I guess, well, but even or... even so, without the family background, the times would have made it yeah difficult for a woman writer to be to write those things. Like oh. yeah, yeah, to write freely. Yeah, they're not supposed to know about those things. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> like having babies. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to have them, but not know about. What happens. <laughs> Exactly. But you're so innocent, Sarah. I believe that yes. of, of you. Brian says, Merry Christmas. 
Merry I Christmas, like, Brian. Thanks I would like to say happy holidays as well. Best of wishes with the new person coming into your life that will be taking up a lot of your time. Mm -hmm. But remember, I don't care if you have pablums splashed over you or what is happening with your hair that day. If you ever feel mm -hmm. like a chat, give us oh. a call and we'll work Thank it you. out. Thank you. I'll be okay. here. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> so you take care and and honestly sarah just thanks just thanks for coming and playing and doing this author thing it's fun it yeah really is. yeah of course thank you for having me vicky and thanks for um talking about death by podcasting too and oh. suggesting that we do this i'm i'm always down to talk about interesting writers maybe mary shelley one day i don't know that much about her so um, look yeah look at we get so sidetracked by their lives i know <laughs> It's at least as interesting as the writing. <laughs> That's right. Okay, you take care and we'll see you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, always, always a joy to have Sarah visiting us. Um, I will see you all next week when Landis Wade, her partner in Death by Podcasting, will be talking to us about his courtroom capers um his trilogy it is vicky just shoveled uh, the christmas courtroom trilogy three standalone cozies that put belief in santa on trial and of course they're going to be humorous so i'm just going to end comments here clean it up and rant i will until then, when we're talking to Landis, and may your coffee be hot and your story sweet. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>